Good morning, good evening, welcome to week 7 of PSHS 6240 here at George Washington University. Just want to start off with announcements. Uh, Adobe Connect session this Thursday, this Thursday, 15 June at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Group 3, the Boston Marathon Group will, will be briefing at that session. Uh, what I will also be doing is a jobs talk. So how to break into the federal government, how to break in the intelligence community, how to transfer from a, a private sector job to a public sector job, uh, those types of issues. So I'll, uh, what I'll ask is if you have questions on that, please let me know before Thursday so I can give an appropriate answer. Um, and if you have experience on the other side of the table, on, on hiring and recruiting, please let me know as well. And you can I'll incorporate your thoughts into the Adobe Connect session. So what we'll do is go about 20, 25, 30 minutes, or let's say 20 minutes for the briefing for the Boston Marathon, five to 10 minutes for questions, and then another 20 to 25 minutes for the job talk as well. So current events, obviously London is the biggest one and I will just say this, uh, I, I think I said this about Manchester and I'll say it again, I think the English are act a little bit more calm in the face of terror than Americans do. I think uh, some of the things that were said in the United States, vice versa, what was said in England, um, I think kind of illustrate that and I'll, I'll leave that point at it, but I, I think what Theresa May and the mayor of London were all saying was accurate is that there's going to be low level violence. There's very little you can do about it, uh, but you can also just go about your daily business. And I think some of the examples of the guy leaving the pub, but still having his beer with him and the guy paying his tip uh, the next day uh, just kind of shows you that the best thing to do is life goes on. Uh, don't let terrorism affect you. And I think that's what I uh, a key point to take away from 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 London. So paper two, paper two was I think much better. I think the topic was a little esoteric, um, and I think uh, the, the examples were a little bit more concrete. Uh, but one thing I will say is you have to get into the scientific details. Uh, don't give just give me a one over the world issue on WMD, one over the world issue of threats that can use WMD or Al Qaeda and WMD. Focus your your, your efforts on one of those examples, whether it's ricin, whether it was serine, whether it was bubonic plague. And if you know the science, let's say sarin, I'll, I'll use this example, um, you, can, you can talk about things like, okay, the shelf life of sarin. Be very specific to sarin. What is the shelf life? How do you acquire the materials? What's binary versus unitary? Uh, how difficult it is to disseminate? What signature does a terrorist group in the United States need to have or to, to execute a sarin attack. Um, those are the types of very detailed scientific issues that would have gotten you a better grade than some of the papers that I, I saw. Um, so if you know, if you go into the science, then your policy can flow from the science. Uh, so that's a, a key point that I, I want to make uh, for, for this paper. And then the last thing I always say is that the Ebola scare, some of you might remember this from three years ago, um, it was a, yeah, the governor of Texas or even the president of the United States, he's not an epidemiologist, he's not an expert in this, but he also is the face of the government trying to counter Ebola. So what he or she needs is not a very technical analysis on Ebola. They need to get to the so what so they can communicate the threat in clear terms so the general public can understand. So person-to-person -person contact transmission rates, our rates are very technical, but one thing you can say, if, again, if you're briefing Ebola, is you have to get in, in contact, very deep contact through saliva and spit uh, in order for Ebola to be transmitted. Um, those are the types of talking points that you would be responsible for to show or try and make sure the public is is not scared of the threat. So when you're going through a paper like this, an exercise like this, think about that. Your paper is going to have to be shared 
with someone that's not a technical expert and he or she is going to have to explain based on your recommendations very very uh clear concise details to warn the general public so review of, of week six i think it was a, a we had a lot of good discussion on the on the discussion boards about 9-11 and the intelligence reform um the one question i'm going to start off with is are we more secure since 9-11 i, I think so um Whatever you want to say about the 9-11 failure and the post-9-11 uh, failures, I think the ability for a terrorist to conduct a 9-11-like attack where you are, you're, you're dealing with dozens of plotters, uh, overseas has freedom of movement, uh, and can, can slip through our border without the proper vigilance, I, I think those days are, are gone. And maybe I'm... I'm being too uh, facetious or, or, or declaring victory too early. But I think our security services are good enough that a large-scale attack is very difficult to execute. And I think the evidence is that the, the, the main attacks that have happened have been lone wolves. Uh, uh, single, double gunmen... Uh, who are doing a low-level attacks, and if you're one or two people and you're not, you don't have a whole network behind you, there's only so much you can do. So I, I do think we are more secure since 9-11, and this has everything to do with uh, stopping overt terrorist presence that we saw before 9-11. It has to do with our drone program. It has to do with our home, Department of Homeland Security and just situational awareness among our, our population. So you, you can debate me on that, and that'd be a, a great paper, but I, I do think we are more secure since 9-11. So this brings up a point. You saw this in the National Geographic. What do you do if you get uh, a memorandum saying bin Laden determined to attack in the U.S.? And let me, let me give you a scenario here. You're Let's say you wrote that paper and the president, you briefed the president on exactly that. Um, and the president says, okay, what do you want me to do? Um, just from my perspective, I think getting a memo so so vague and unspecific like that uh, probably isn't even worth briefing. But the one thing you can say is, uh, you would probably you should you should give solid recommendations to allow the policymaker in this case the president to bracket the problem. So instead of saying okay, Bin Laden determined to attack in the U.S. and give that vague say, and sir, based on this threat, I recommend you increase surveillance on U.S. aircraft or increase whatever countermeasures are in the FAA to properly secure aircraft. So I think you, I would recommend doubling the budget for immigration and customs so they can uh, better secure our borders. Sir, I recommend you invade Afghanistan. Now, if you gave something like, I recommend you invade Afghanistan before 9-11, you better be, that threat better be very, very specific and very, very credible. And by saying, I want you to invade Afghanistan, you are conveying as an intel analyst how detailed the threat is. Now, some people will say Intel doesn't do policy. That's what's taught at uh, Intel schools. Those of you who've gone through the schools probably heard that that refrain. Uh, I don't buy it. And I'm not going to say that Intel should do policy per se, but I also think Intel should be relevant and should inform policy as well. Uh, the problem when you say Intel doesn't policy, do policy that means you can play boy who cried wolf, like in this Bin Laden case. You know, I told you, I warned you, I warned you, I warned you. But that doesn't tell you anything about how the intelligence was communicated or that if the intelligence uh, could actually be relevant to a policymaker. Saying every day the threat's there, the threat's there, the threat's there, that's not very relevant. Uh, but you know, by bracketing the problem, by giving solid policy recommendations based on your intelligence analysis, you have given a policymaker at least a uh, right and left limits for what he should be doing or how he or she should react to the intelligence. They don't have to obey you. That's their prerogative. But I think that gives you a, a little bit more uh, fidelity. 
you know, many of you have been in Iraq, and one thing you should do is if you're saying, sir, there's a higher IED threat on this main supply route or this big road, uh, you should give solid recommendations and say, and sir, there's a, a IED threat, and I would recommend suspending all daytime convoy movements. Or, sir, I would recommend travel be slowed to 10 miles an hour, which means you can spot IEDs better. Or, sir, I recommend you suspend all convoys coming in and out on this road. Um, those are the types of recommendations that allow the commander at that level to bracket the problem. So I think that's a, a key point is, you know, ask the question, what, what do you do if the, the president came back or any policymaker said, OK, what do you want me to do? You should have an answer prepared for that. Was 9-11 an intelligence failure? Um, before I saw the Nova documentary, I, I would might have a lot of sympathy if you said it wasn't it, it was not an intelligence failure. Uh, a lot of bad things happen in the world. And in a free democratic society, it's sometimes hard to stop everything. Um, so I, I, I might have agreed with you that 9-11 was uh, not an intelligence failure. However, when I saw the Nova documentary, uh, I, I think the fact that we had people in, uh, we had two known bin Laden associates in San Diego communicating with a known safe house in Yemen. And we knew about that. And the NSA did not feel it prudent to pass that out to the FBI or the state local law enforcement. Um, that is a pretty significant failure. Uh, not only did we know about these two people, but the, the NSA and the CIA who were aware of them did not pass this on to FAA, so they could conduct a, uh, you know, a watch list to prevent them from boarding aircraft. Uh, th those were the, the, the large intel failures that we knew two of them. We knew of their names. They were in our system. We knew they were communicating, and it was known by our intelligence agencies, and it was not properly disseminated. So that, I think, is an intelligence failure. The other point um, I would bring up is we probably should have known that a, an aircraft could have been used like a Tomahawk missile. Um, that is a, a, there was plenty of warning, as you saw in the National Geographic uh, documentary. Um, you know, the, the Paris, they tried to do it in 1994. James Yusuf tried to do it in 1995. And the most important part is it wouldn't have been that hard to stop an aircraft being used like a Tomahawk missile. Uh, right now, if you board an aircraft, you can see a, uh, a drink cart in front of the, the cabin or in front of the, the cockpit every time the cockpit's open. That simple countermeasure would have probably prevented a 9-11. Reinforcing, not even all the doors, reinforcing a third of aircraft doors would have prevented a 9-11. Putting air marshals on a third or a quarter of, of aircraft would have prevented a, a 9-11-like attack. Um, just changing the tactic where a, a pilot resists a hijack or a crew of an aircraft resists a hijacker as opposed to acquiescing, that would have prevented 9-11. So it wouldn't have been that hard. So you, you know this scenario has occurred. You know that terrorists have been trying to do this for 10 years. But you could have, in order to stop it, very simple countermeasures could have been implemented that is an intelligence failure as well. So two things, the fact that we knew about these folks that were in the country, and two, that we were, um, uh, we should have been aware that an aircraft could have been used as a Tomahawk missile. So going on to the Fort Hood shooting, um, and this keeps coming up. When should radicalization be monitored? This has now come up in the Manchester attack, the London attack, the Orlando attack. Um, so when do I get to say, when do we triage uh, someone like Nadal Hassan so they get full scrutiny? Uh, is it when they start talking about radical Islam? Well, Jesus Christ, there's thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people who have publicly sympathized either through speeches or their email or through their uh, 
social media sympathy for uh, radical ideas, radical Islamic ideas. Uh, you couldn't monitor all those people. Um, and hell, it's a free country. You are allowed to sympathize with radical, you know, as Nadal Hassan said, you're allowed to say, you know, the United States isn't, uh, you know, is waging war on Islam, and that's wrong. That's It's a free country, you're allowed to say that. Uh, what about when he starts communicating with Anwar al -Aki? Okay, possibly. But again, uh, thousands of people subscribe, hundreds of thousands of people subscribe to Anwar al YouTube channels. Um, thousands of people subscribe to ISIS social media channels. You can't monitor all of them. Um, and then let's, let's flip it on its head a little bit. You know, we talked about the Islamic problem. How many people subscribe to right-wing extremist ideas. Uh, what happens if I, if I have sympathies for uh, people who don't like uh, the former President Obama? Those are certainly, you can argue that they're a little bit, uh, there's some sympathies to right-wing extremists in those groups. Now, you know, very few of them, but again, if you're, uh, you know, the bottom line is at what point does my speech go from free speech to I deserve to be put on a list for further scrutiny. When, do, when does that happen in a, in a free democracy? Um, so other question, do we have appropriate funding structures and personnel to stop intelligence failures? Um, I don't think anybody recommended this. Um, but the question is, okay, if we don't have enough money, you know, why do we still have these failures? Uh, and is there, is there funding streams, is there more agents that we need, more personnel, better organization to stop you know, the, the, the attacks that we've seen in, in Orlando and, and for Britain and Manchester? Um, that's something to, to consider. And then one thing we might have to just ask, is there, just like the mayor of London said, is there always going to be low-level attacks? In a free society, do we have to... Just say, yes, you know, if you want to open fire on a club in Orlando, even if you were, you have, you showed some elements of being radicalized or, or, or radical behavior, if you want, you know, if you want to buy a gun, which is free in our society and go open fire, there's very little you can do from it, from a, a law enforcement perspective, um, do we have to just accept that as a society? I'll, I'll let you aside. And then the intelligence versus policy, I, I talked about that in, in the previous bullets, but uh, just, you know, again, intelligence has to be very relevant to policy and I think provide solid recommendations, even though you are not the policymaker. So all these to consider as we, as we go through weeks, or as we went through week six and as we went through the EU video in week five, when it comes to, okay, how do we triage people? We can't arrest everyone. That gap that I've talked about between somebody doing something that may not be illegal, but certainly shows elements of being radicalized and what we can do to arrest them. That's where a lot of these people fit in this gap. They're on the radar of law enforcement, but there's only so much we can do in a free society. So that's what, you know, some of your paper topics are going to be is, okay, when can we start you know, where's the line? Where's the line for uh, constitution, for resources that we could say, okay, this person should be monitored? Um, and that would be an interesting paper topic. So preview week seven, uh, we're going to talk about leadership targeting. The Byman and Cronin are, are good articles that talk about, you know, it being a strategy or a tactic uh, or even both. Um, you know, when does it work? When does it not work? And this is drones, but leadership targeting in general. And then we're going to go into uh, conditions that led to Islamic radicalism in the U.S. since 2009, the domestic threat. Um, there's two good documentaries. Unfortunately, they're on premium channels. Showtime and HBO both have documentaries on this. I haven't, I haven't assigned them, but uh, if I can get those documentaries on Amazon or something, I'll probably sign it for a future course. But if you have HBO or Showtime, it might be good to, to watch those documentaries as well. Uh, so, uh, with that being said, I look forward to discussion boards, and I look forward to seeing everyone at the, or 
group three at least at the Adobe Connect session this week.